Hello and welcome to this week's episode of About Abortion. Uh, I'm joined once again by Tim, uh, calling in from Harrogate, and uh, we thought it was about time we gave you listeners uh, an update on uh, the lie of the land in Parliament since the election. We want to talk you through um, how the the face of Parliament has changed uh, in terms of pro-life personnel, in terms of uh, possible or um, definite legislation and policy changes coming up. Um, we want to help you uh, with your prayers and uh, with um, information for, for your actions uh, as well. So, so today really is a prayer briefing. Uh, we want to bring you right up to speed and uh, we're going to finish with a, a bit of a look at the way people uh, responded to the Vote Life campaign. Listeners will have uh, noticed that we've been talking a fair bit about how people could vote uh, in a, a pro-life way, be that for a Vote Life independent candidate or one of the other pro-life parties. Um, and so we're going to be uh, talking about how people responded to that and uh, and then finally really linking that to how the church responded to that. Um, because um, in some cases, uh, the church didn't respond ever so differently from the world. And that's something that needs a bit of looking at. So Tim, thank you for uh, joining me once again. Um, how are things at your end? You say you're on week, week two of the holidays, week one, not that you're counting. No, no, no. Uh, week at the end of week one, Dave. Yeah, of the six weeks holidays. Um, you know, it's it's a blessing that it can be can be uh, something to adapt to for us and the children. So so yeah, no, it's but it's nice. The sun's come out, so it's been generally better weather. So praise God for that. Uh, but we're doing well, thanks. Yeah. But for those who don't know, Tim has uh, four lovely boys uh, and a dog. Um, I was one of four boys, and uh, I know what we did to the house that we lived in. So I can well imagine that having four boys at home for a few weeks presents its uh, challenges as well as blessings. Um, so, Tim, we are talking today about, um, yeah, really what, what the election did. You and I last spoke, I think, on this channel um, days before, was it like two days before um, the election? And one of the things we sought to do was uh, to warn people really against just going along with the, the sort of the tide of, of voting for casually pro-abortion uh, politicians and parties and so on. And uh, what what was predicted largely has happened. Uh, Labour obviously won um, with a, a large majority in terms of seats, not in terms of overall votes, um, it should be noted. Uh, not a big margin on that side of things, but certainly in terms of seats, um, a huge victory. Um, are things as bad now as we feared? What's what's the picture in Parliament uh, now that we have a Labour government, or is it is it too early to tell? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, well, I should say as well. I should I should clarify. Um, the dog, the dog, I'm afraid went some some time ago. But um, yeah, the, the four boys are well. <laughs> the dog did go, but uh, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So. I think the first thing to say is that in terms of one of the encouragements is that obviously before the election itself, um, Right to Life, uh, which is obviously another large pro-life organization in the UK, they were encouraging uh, people to vote to their, sorry, to um, contact their uh, prospective uh, MPs, those who are standing in the elections and ask them to sign, ask the candidates to sign the Right to Life and um, Both Lives uh, Matter kind of UK pledge, election pledge. And I think it was encouraging that 200 candidates did sign that in the end. So I think we just, I'd like to kind of record that because I think that was, that was a really encouraging. Now, that doesn't mean that those 200 were elected, but I think obviously among those standing, th there were many who were willing to put their heads above the parapets and, and sign that. Obviously, when the election itself came around, July the 4th, kind of as predicted, it was a massive, you know, Labour landslide you're right to point out not really in vote numbers um, or not really popular vote wise, but certainly in terms of the number of seats won. Um, and there were some concerns. There were some disappointments, I think, from a pro-life perspective. I think we have to be really clear about that. So we've talked a little bit about in the past, how does one quite uh, judge or, or categorize a pro-life MP? And we've talked before that uh, sometimes even even MPs who claim to be quite pro-life, if you look at their voting record, it doesn't always match up. But, you know, 
speaking kind of general terms, and I'm going here by the, the CARE website, so Christian Action Research and Action. Um, is it, sorry, that's not, that's, not the right, that's not the right acronym. But and ed education, that's CARA. The, yeah, that's right. So education, thank you. So 15 pro-life MPs, according to CARE, lost their seats, and, and, and they would include some very notable folks like uh, Fiona Bruce, Liam Fox, Caroline Ansel, uh, who'd obviously recently tabled the amendments before Parliament dissolved to reduce the uh, abortion time limit to 22 weeks. Miriam Cates, who was uh, quite a new MP, but, but also quite an um, outspoken one, and other folks like Jacob Rees-Mogg. So 15 uh, pro-life MPs lost their seats. Um, some obviously did retain them. So again, according to, according to CARE, uh, folks like Mary Glinden, Edward Lee, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, Danny Kruger, Carla Lockhart, obviously Carla Lockhart from the DUP, uh, which of the kind of mainstream parties, the most consistently pro-life by far. So a number did hold on to their seats, but there was a sizable loss there. And, and there may be one or two who've come in in the new parliament that, that are also pro-life, but, but, I, but I think that's probably unlikely. I mean, obviously most of the Labour MPs who have come in, I think unfortunately, one can assume that they are pro-abortion, pro-choice, uh, however well that one wants to understand that. So I think in terms of net gains and losses, it has been um, definitely a net loss. I think if, if we look at the last time, the snap election in 2019, that was a big gain for, for pro-life uh, MPs, pro-life voices. This has been something of a loss really, to, to be to be completely Completely honest. So, so that is a cause for concern. It's a cause for for for, for prayer, certainly. Um, and I think when you look at the numbers and how they're set up and how Labour have this huge majority, I think the concern there is is you know the power dynamic is if if certain Labour MPs want to really push hard uh, on the pro-abortion front, I would be worried about how much genuine opposition they're going to meet actually in that, you know, as they go about that. Um, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a few of the kind of challenging fronts really we've got. So, and I think it's good to see these things in the round. So we're, we're obviously going to focus on abortion, but I think these things come together. So, so assisted suicide, I think that is going to be uh, on the table in a major way. Um, you know, Keir Starmer said he wants to create space for Parliament to, to debate that very issue. He's promised a free vote on it. Uh, in the House of Lords, Lord Falconer has just recently made a seventh attempt to introduce assisted suicide as a private member's bill. Very unlikely that a private member's bill would come into uh, law, certainly from the Lords. But again, it's just increasing the profile. So I think that is very much going to be uh, up for debate in this current Parliament. Second thing, and these are all things that, that the Right to Life website also highlight, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, uh, HIFA, uh, which we don't often talk about, but, but that uh, authority and the biotech firms that, that sort of undertake experimentation on human embryos, so very, very young and born children, essentially, these groups are seeking to make changes to the, to the law, um, the most significant changes since 2008, when they allowed the creation of human animal hybrid embryos, sort of disgusting kind of Frankenstein development. And one of their goals is to remove the the 14 day limit from current legislation so that they will be able to experiment on human embryos, as I say, unborn children, up to when they are 28 days, four weeks gestation. So that's a quite significant step that is probably gonna be pushed in this next uh, parliament. Um, very troubling, I think, from a pro-life perspective and from a human perspective, really. Um, and then in terms of abortion specifically, as I said, this huge influx of Labour MPs, uh, pretty much universally pro-abortion, uh, and that is going to embolden the abortion lobby. Um, that is going to embolden, I think, folks like uh, Stella Creasy, Diana Johnson, Rupert Hook, and, you know, it's very clear that they have massive support from from the abortion lobby, BPAS, um, MSI, Reproductive Choices, and they've got huge money behind them as well. And I think they're going to try at some point to introduce, to force three changes to our abortion laws that would potentially allow for abortion up to birth, that, that would certainly attempt to decriminalise abortion. And so 
some of the most horrific cases we've seen recently, like Carla and Lily Foster, I think under the changes they're proposing, these things will become much more routine. There'd be really no kind of uh, scrutiny for uh, for the destruction of, of children um, in these kind of at-home abortions right up to birth. Now, the, how this happens is, is debatable. Often it's not like a, a big bill with a big kind of flashing sign that says that. Often it's through amendments to the table that are kind of tacked on to other bills, other government bills. That's certainly how things have happened in recent times. Um, so, so one doesn't quite know how it's going to happen, but I think we have to be vigilant and I think we have to almost expect at some point some of these or multiple challenges on these fronts. And as I say, with Labour dominating Parliament, these radical pro-abortion measures, I think, will be very hard to stop once they gain a certain traction. So we do really need to be fervent in our prayers against it, Dave. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of About Abortion. I hope you're appreciating these podcasts. And if you are, can I ask for your help in getting these vital messages to more people? We're delighted that we can get these to people free of charge uh, but that's not free for us to produce. It costs something like three to four hundred pounds a month to get these podcasts produced. And I wonder if you could help us, partner with us financially. Uh, many of us will have uh, an Amazon Prime subscription or some kind of streaming platform to the tune of six, seven, eight pounds a month. I wonder if you consider, as it were, taking out a subscription uh, with us. If you could donate, say, eight pounds a month, if we had about 40 people donating around eight pounds a month, just eight pounds a month, uh, that would help us to continue to do these podcasts uh, free of charge for anyone who uh, wants to listen in. And this is the only podcast uh, specifically about abortion in the UK. It's the greatest injustice, not only of our time, but in all history. Would you help us uh, to bring these life-saving messages to more people? And don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe. Do send this in particular to your church leaders and, uh, and anyone else you think might be interested. Thank you so much for your support, and uh, I'll let you get back to the episode now. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Tim. That's, that's really helpful. And um, I, I think you heard it as well, the, the recent podcast with Beth and Callum McKellar. And uh, I found it very sobering what he had to say about these upcoming embryology um, uh, you know, policies, potentially. Um, they, they've been waiting in the wings for, for many years. And he says, yeah, in these next few weeks, months, they are going to come out. And he said, the church is absolutely nowhere on even beginning to think these things through. And, you know, whilst we've been thinking about planes to Rwanda and, you know, affordable housing and whatever else, right underneath our noses is something that is actually so dystopian. I think people can't compute what you're talking about you know when i remember it was i was alive in 2008 but i never i i I'd, either i didn't hear about or i heard about and just simply didn't believe that we were now making human animal hybrid embryos it is so dystopian it sounds like something out of the matrix um and uh the church is not is not engaging at all on that stuff um and it's just ever so significant you know when we treat human beings as matter to be experimented with, played around with, like Play-Doh. Let's 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 try and stick this on, see what happens. But it is so sick. And um, something I, f- I find helpful from what Nancy Piercy wrote in her book, Love Thy Body, is she said, when we accept a practice, and legislation is accepting a practice, that's what legislation does. It makes certain practices legally acceptable. And for many people, that's the closest they have to a moral framework. So it makes things morally acceptable. She says, when you accept a practice or a behavior, whether you want to or not, you accept the logic that underpins that behavior. And that logic will lead to other things as well. So the moment you accept that a human at early stages can be experimented upon, um, you're accepting a logic which could easily be used for experimenting on, for example, elderly folks with dementia. Uh, or those with who are you know on their way out anyway or whatever you say, well there's an opportunity here let's do some science it could help people this person's dying anyway there's actually a stronger case you could say for experimenting on people who are already dying than experimenting on people who uh, have their whole life before them you know there's a chilling and very inhumane logic there which um 
we're on the cusp of accepting an even greater measure. And so, yeah, I just want to plug to listeners again, if you didn't listen to that episode with Callum McKellar, please do go back. A fantastic, but also deeply disturbing conversation between Beth and, and Callum on these things, and in particular this upcoming legislation. It's really, really significant, and we've got to catch up um, very quickly um, to be of any use at all um, as that comes to Parliament. Um, but yeah, thank you, Tim. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, actually, just before I go back to you is I we, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that in 2019 we saw an influx of pro-life MPs and then just now we've seen a net loss? Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I, I don't. But it does seem to me that some kind of point has been crossed in our nation. I think we are moving into a time of being under God's judgment in quite a uh, in quite a pronounced way. And I think in some senses, we've invited that by not taking these issues seriously. In 2019, since then, we've had five years to actually get ahead of these issues, uh, build on that momentum in Parliament. Um, but instead, we've been just blown about by every latest craze or so-called crisis of the day. Uh, all the while largely ignoring the real crisis uh, of the day. And I think, in a sense, we've we've reaped what we've sown over the last five years. We've continued to not take the baby genocide seriously. Um, we've continued to believe whatever the media says. We've agreed that, you know, something like COVID-19 is a, is a great crisis that demands urgent church attention, whereas the baby genocide is totally irrelevant. And I think I think we're reaping what we're saying, and I think we we we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror here and say, we've kind of got the parliament we asked for. Well, we have. I mean, that's how democracy works, right? We've we've got the parliament we asked for, and I think repentance has got to be the first the first step on the on the long road back. But um, anyway, Tim, let me let me um, put it back to you. Um, tell us about um, vote life. Uh, Specifically, we, we've obviously hosted one or two spokespeople from Boat Life on this channel over the last few weeks. Um, how did that little project um, turn out in the end? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a, I think it was a tremendous how. Um, obviously, Christian Christian Hatting founded Boat Life, which we should say is not a it's not a party itself. It's a sort of a, a collective for independent candidates who were uh, running under very much a pro life uh, banner. Uh, on a pro-life ticket um and i think i do want to yeah i do want to give a massive shout out to those guys but both those 22 candidates who stood individually and also christian himself because i think you know i think we were probably all expecting a a um election in september or even the back end of the autumn and suddenly rishi sunak said it's going to be mm. july the 4th so i think the time uh it was turned around in was was tremendous and i think I think a lot of the infrastructure has now been put in place, and, and I and I noticed actually that they are they are planning a sort of follow up conference and gathering at the end of September to really reflect on that and to try and create this momentum or build on that momentum. Sorry, um, of those who came forward up and down the country, so really across the whole country, right from Gateshead up in the north, mm. right to the uh, south of England, um, and also there's things like the Wilberforce Walk that have been planned as well. So. Yeah, in terms of the numbers, in terms of the data, so we had, as I say, 22 candidates across the length and breadth of the UK, really, which was fantastic. They were people from all sorts of different walks of life, uh, women and men. Uh, many uh, took part in their local hustings, uh, so they were sort of in-person candidates, as it were. They spoke very passionately uh, in their hustings, and they really you know, put a human face to these issues, uh, mm. and I think that was fantastic. Obviously, a key part of the strategy was to get this. Um, it was literally isn't free, I should say that, but it's delivered for free by by the Royal Mail into every home within the constituencies that these candidates represented. So we're talking well over a, uh, a million people um, reached through this. Uh, obviously, twenty two candidates as as a proportion is 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 not a huge amount. So six hundred and fifty seats contested so so it's it, it's not 10 percent of that but i think it shows you what could be built on and the fact that we could reach so many just with 22 i think uh the foundation is there so we did receive 5276 votes 
across the country, which for a completely new uh, initiative, I think was was really good. Um, mm. uh, several, a couple of seats received over five hundred votes, which was fantastic. So that was Coventry Northwest and Washington and Gateshead mm. South. Uh, who actually uh, the 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 candidate there, Sharon McClafferty, she got six hundred twenty seven votes, which uh, amounted to one point seven percent of those voting in in Washington and Gateshead South. So that's fantastic. Wow. A little bit of a shout out for for her, but you know, I want to I want to really thank and congratulate all those who stood because I think it was a great achievement. And um, so 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 those five thousand or so five thousand two hundred seventy six votes. What I'm saying there, Dave, is if, if one was to extrapolate those figures, so if we had had a candidate in every constituency, in every seat, and we got the kind of average that we did, um, we'd be looking at well in excess of 150,000 votes across the UK, which is a significant amount, I think. And as I say, this was all mm -hmm. done with, with relatively little time to prepare, time to brief, time to you know draw the thing together. I think on future elections, we'll have much more uh, capacity, much more people. But I think it was a, a, a fantastic uh, achievement, but obviously there's room to expand that network. So if you are interested, I think, in, in the Vote Life network, in hearing about um, the work, as I say, do go onto the Vote Life website because you can sign up. I think there's a super early bird ticket for the conference, in, which has been held in Coventry, uh, which is one of the uh, seats that, that really smashed that 500 vote threshold. Um, if you want to find out more, that's great. Obviously, for those um, candidates that didn't get that 500 vote threshold, they they don't get their deposit back. So, you know, if you want to donate, if you want to contribute to, to the cause and to the kind of uh, election war chest for future campaigns, then I know uh, Vote Life will be very grateful for your help and support there as well. So a little bit of a, that's kind of in numbers, Dave. So 22 seats. Um over 5,000 votes, as I say, if one was to kind of extrapolate across, we'd be looking at well in excess of 150, 156,000 votes is my is my kind of back of an envelope calculation. So something to build on. And I think just getting that message out there, getting that imagery out there, mm. and it was very significant. Obviously, some of the seats that we chose to run in were seats that were being um, contested by some of the most strongly pro abortion MPs, so so um, Hull, uh, Diana Johnson's uh, seat, and Walthamstow, uh, Stella Creasy's seat, where Ruth Rawlins ran and, and spoke very uh, passionately, very courageously at, at the hustings there. Um, and yeah, so, so and actually the, it did garner publicity. So one of the things we're going to discuss is this BBC article, BBC Look North, which focused on uh, Pauline Peachy and her um, running in in the in the constituency that Diana Johnson um, in the end ended up um, holding for Labour, but the literature she produced or the literature that went out to these homes in Hull and the the way it got people talking, I think whether people agreed with it or not, it got people talking. It got that that issue front and centre for those people in Hull, which was fantastic and which is what we wanted to yeah. one of the key aims of the uh, of the work. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's really the the key genius of the project. Probably is is that um, educational sort of thrust. Um, as we were talking earlier about what happened between twenty nineteen and twenty twenty four, well, it just shows at one level how much education is still needed within the church, but also just within the nation. Um, people are still not seeing the unborn child for who they are. They're still not seeing this issue as the greatest human rights injustice of our day. And um, unique to this issue, as opposed to any other, a single image is enough to radically challenge someone's entire worldview, really, um, their whole way of thinking on this issue. A single image can demonstrate instantly um, the humanity of the unborn child and therefore that what's going on is a genocide. Instantly, no words needed. Um, and that's something that's unique, perhaps, to this issue, or it's unusual. You know, you can't really convey accurately in a single image the ramifications of an immigration bill or, um, you know, affordable housing or or, or whatever. You know, um, the, at best, you can capture one aspect, but the entire issue of abortion hangs on this one thing. What is the unborn child? 
and these pictures just just hit that so wonderfully so i really appreciate about this project how it was um so much it was about getting these pictures into homes um i i think well over a million households received uh, the image uh, which is incredible you think how many conversations that sparked um and and then of course those images then get put online by people whether positively or negatively in a sense doesn't really matter the image gets out further again and as you say the bbc picked up on it so i do think it's so um wonderful how many people got that um, education through this and i think that's absolutely right we're still at a stage in this movement where education is critical we cannot assume we're talking about the same thing when we talk about abortion and pro-life people have an entirely different framing and the pictures uniquely shatter that false framing that this is healthcare, that this is a woman's right, it's reproductive justice, whatever Melinda Gates was calling it the other day, you know, in her support for Kamala Harris, it was, I think she used the term reproductive justice or some reproductive autonomy or you know, some kind of garbage like that. We're talking about killing babies here, but people are so used to hearing euphemisms uh, covering up the violence and the, and the oppression um, that they just don't have the right image in their head when they hear the word abortion. And these pictures um, get right to the heart of that very, very quickly. So all credit to, to Vote Life, but also a word, I think, to, to listeners who, you know, for, for many, I think, of pro-life conviction, their default sort of pro-life activity beyond praying is I'll write to my MP or I'll, I'll vote in a certain way. And those things are important, but we cannot neglect the, um, the urgent need for education. And, uh, and so getting the pictures out there, getting this in front of the public is, is critical. So anyone who's not already involved in some way in education work, public education work, um, please do go to cbiuk.org slash join, J-O-I-N. You can get our training for free. Uh, you can find out what teams are operating local to where you are. Doesn't mean you have to stand on the streets with them necessarily. There are various ways in which you can support and be involved, but please take to heart that that need is in a sense, greater than ever. And uh, all credit to Vote Life for, um, for yeah, doing something to meet that need. But um, so tell us then, Tim, so, so you mentioned a, a BBC article. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that sounds like uh, the very constituency in which William Wilberforce stood many years ago. Um, he was a, a member of parliament uh, for, I think, that exact constituency in Hull, um, uh, standing against the great injustice of his day. Um, so yeah, tell us what happened there, and how how did the BBC uh, report on our our good friend Pauline Peachy and uh, and her efforts? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to put the link up, the BBC Look North link up, and I would encourage everyone to to to, to look at it and watch it for themselves. But I'm, I'm I'll run through just some of the highlights uh, from that little. It's actually under three minutes the piece, but but it covers a lot within those three minutes. I mean, the BBC, uh, the, the 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 main newsreader. Um, introduce it as graphic anti-abortion leaflets and what a load i mean even that it's a loaded description isn't it you know that sort of language graphic imagery you know it's probably stuff we'd associate more with extreme violence with pornography with those kind of other things that will come with a trigger warning mm. and yet what does this image actually show and i think just to explain the image for those who are listening or you know for those who are not able to access online or whatever this is a six uh, week old unborn child so six weeks from fertilization this is an image of a living unborn unborn human child uh it's from i, I also want to point out because i think this is important it's from the endowment for uh, human development um ehd it's the image we use across all our kind of visual imagery uh, of, the, of the living child it is ehd is not a pro-life organization is not a christian organization i was on it just this morning and in fact they say they have a position of neutrality official neutrality on bioethical questions such as abortion so this is absolutely not a kind of christian pro-life right-wing organization all the usual kind of labels that get thrown around this is not an image that's been doctored or messed with this is simply a kind of scientific uh image um and, and it shows the child in the womb in all his or her beauty um you know I, I i'm not sure you can tell the gender of the child at this stage you certainly probably can't tell the ethnicity this is the wonder of this of this of this image really it could be any one of us um this is something that you would see in, in a medical textbook uh on 
embryology is something you'd find very easily on the internet by putting in you know unborn child or six week pregnancy or whatever it's, it's obviously something people pay a lot of money for and these kind of 4d scans or what have you of, of their own children and yet it, it it comes with all this kind of uh trigger warning and, and outrage and just to run through some of the responses i mean they're fairly if you've been in this work for any time they're the sort of things you encounter a lot but i nevertheless that the level of yeah, the level of vitriol and the level of sort of vehemence is is still striking. Um, so, so one woman says, I would describe it as shameful. Uh, rip it up and bin it. That's her um, message. Um, another man, equally disgruntled, absolutely disgusted with it, he says. Uh, basically says this whole thing should be under hospitals and doctors to sort that out. And, and when he says sort that out, you know, quite know what he means there does, does he just mean we would sort out these children that are a bit of an inconvenience it it's not a very sort of informed or developed response but but this is the level people are responding at it's very it's not particularly thought through it's it's quite kind of gut level response um one woman and this is the, this is the really interesting thing which we'll come into when i kind of try and drag some of these themes together in a moment but one woman objects to it because her grandson is currently in neonatal intensive care unit so so she has a grandson who's, who's been born um who's, who's maybe a little bit premature or has some other health condition one's not sure her child her grandchild is being cared for and somehow she associates this image of an unborn child a very early stage unborn child with her grandchild and, and deems it inappropriate um and this theme of upset and, and offence comes up quite a lot. I should say there is also one uh, voice, that at least one voice that the BBC choose, chose to show, who was in favour of the image. Um, like I'm guessing from the name that it was maybe someone from an Indian heritage background. She she, she, find, she describes herself as a Catholic, a pro-life Catholic, and, and she speaks of the need for awareness that these images um speak to and and she recognizes that some people might not like it some people might object but she says it needs to be talked about it needs to be got out into the public square as it were but i think what's really interesting when and people can as i say watch the video and go through the responses in fine detail but i think certain themes emerge dave one of which is around sort of the horror and outrage at this imagery as i say language like disgusting shameful is used people literally want to kind of physically destroy them and of course as as we've seen when we've gone out on displays that, that happens quite literally people often try and remove the banners tear them down rip them up etc and and this is you know this is an image of a child in the in the womb you know and any young child walking by when we're on the streets or looking at that picture instantly knows what this depicts it's a baby you know this is what we all once looked like including of course those queuing up to condemn it um, the, the the very image, as I say, would be a source of delight and pride and joy when it was a kind of pregnancy scan that would get pinned to the fridge or shared on social media. In this context, is not seen as a cause for celebration, but as a but as a source of disgust, horror, outrage, and and real anger. And I think when you see that level of animosity and aggression, actually, you realise what well, something else is going on here. There's a spiritual element to this that's the only real explanation i think for the level of hostility uh that was encountered in this in this woman's um series of interviews you know the god of this world the bible says has blinded the minds of unbelievers blinded the eyes of unbelievers so people are no longer seeing this observing this image neutrally they're seeing it through a very ideological lens i would suggest and as we've pointed out as you've pointed out a number of times Dave, behind these sort of raised hackles is, I think, the realisation that such an image actually confronts um, a worldview, confronts a, a, you know, a dearly held belief, a, a carefully protected idol. It explodes the lies of the enemy, the lies of wider society that pregnancy is just a lump of cells, it's mere biological tissue. It's certainly not a distinct human life, a human person. And that, you know, the child has no rights beyond whether the parents decide to keep it or not. 
uh, that the child, in fact, should not even be described as a child, perhaps until very late in the pregnancy or, or probably after birth even. So the image is controversial because I think people realise in an instant, actually, what they're looking at and, and it, it, they realise that this image blows to pieces the lies that they've maybe not fully convinced themselves of, but they've kind of heard so many times that they've sort of inoculated themselves to the truth. An image like this, as you say, a picture tells a thousand words, it blows that apart. And it's a trigger. So so, so we hear this language a lot. It's, it's going to upset people. It's going to cause offence. Um, and sometimes that's not because people are sort of strongly ideologically in favour of abortion per se. It might be that they've been through their own traumas, maybe pregnancy loss, miscarriage, stillbirth. And I think obviously we want to be very sensitive to people's stories, to people's struggles. But I think we, 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 we can't ask ourselves all the time before we speak, before we do anything, is this going to offend? Is this going to upset someone? Um, we're not trying deliberately to cause offence, but if an image like those that have been displayed on these leaflets, if that is upsetting someone, then I think we should realise it's equally possible that a, that a passing pregnant woman, a mother pushing a pram, or even a baby might itself cause upset or offence. You know, do we do we ban pregnant women? Do we ban babies from appearing in public? Do we ban every nappy, every baby milk advert on, on similar grounds? And, you know, people objected to this being pushed through their letterbox, but yeah, I get junk mail all the time. I get things through my letterbox all the time that have pictures on promotional material. I've not consented to that being pushed through my letterbox. I've not consented to looking at this or that, but it's there. And so, you know, how can we how can we sort of single out this sort of imagery as as a cause for offence and something to be banned on that on those grounds? And I think it just flags up the inconsistency and hypocrisy of people's attitudes. And and in this remarkable comment of this woman objecting because her grandson is in neonatal intensive care unit. So because a precious baby has been born um, and medical personnel are doing all they can to look after that child, to, to monitor, to maybe heal that little life, the parents in the hospital realise in that instance that that life is precious, that that life deserves protection, and that really every everything that's done that's been done to, to preserve that life is, is, is being kind of looked at. And yet an image of an infant at the very start of their life, similarly precious, fearfully and wonderfully made, seeking to remind, educate people of the value of that life, where we all come from, what we all look like at that at this age and stage, is somehow inappropriate, somehow offensive. I, I, I just I don't really I don't really follow the logic. I, I don't think it is actually particularly logical. Um but but it's you know, it's a sense that, well, it's not the time or the place to discuss that. But of course, we're never told what the time or place is when it's appropriate to discuss that. And as you said, Dave, we're, we're worried about HS2, we're worried about affordable housing, this and that. But the one thing we don't want to discuss is the quarter of a million children that were killed in the womb in 2022, for the year for which we have the most up-to-date uh, figures, the most up-to-date data. So... All that's going on. I think there's also the natural human response, the kind of carnal response of not wanting to be told what to do or what to think, not wanting to be challenged. You know, it's that sort of human arrogance, human pride, human sinfulness. And of course, behind that is this personal autonomy. I'll do things my way. I'll, thanks God, I've heard your command, but I'm going to take the fruit from the tree. My body, my choice. I'm going to do what I want sort of thing. Um, the key thing about abortion, of course, is that it isn't just about personal autonomy. It's not just about making decisions for oneself. It's a decision that has a direct and fatal um, effect on another human life and the most vulnerable, innocent and helpless of human beings. And then just a final thing, um, you know, before I hand back, Dave, is I think this also one thread that comes across in some of the responses is that this is really a medical matter. This is something for the NHS to sort out. This is something for the hospital, the doctors to do. It, it's certainly not something um, that, that, that the church should be offering uh, a, a perspective on. The church should be offering a kind of opinion on. Um, we don't want the church pontificating on this. This is purely for the hospital and doctors to sort out. So this most weighty 
of moral issues is kind of completely subcontracted away to the NHS. Um, and we all know that it's the NHS actually that abort the vast majority of unborn children in this country every year. So, yeah, something of the, of the certainly of the passion of the animosity of the people's response comes across in that. And I think we're going to, in a future podcast, see how some of those arguments, and often arguments is a very generous term for the reactions, we see that parroted in the church's objections to the work we do that public education, but I don't want to kind of give too much of that away. But yeah, so I would encourage people to watch the video. And again, I would thank, uh, you know, our sister Pauline for for standing in that historic hall constituency and taking on Dana Johnson and the culture of death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well done to Pauline. And yeah, thanks, uh, Tim, for what you said there. I think I think the, the, the spiritual reality behind these reactions has to be seen. Uh, it is so extreme. We're talking about a beautiful living image here. And we know that Satan has come to steal, kill and destroy. He hates God and therefore he hates the image of God. So so Satan is trying to destroy um, human beings, image bearers directly. We see that in a very marked way with, you know, uh, through Pharaoh, the genocide of the Hebrew boys back in Egypt, Exodus chapters one and two. Um, or just chapter one, isn't it? And then we've got, you know, obviously the massacre of the innocents, his attempt to get Jesus. But it's carrying on today um, in real life uh, through the baby genocide. But there's something reflected in that when a person sees an image, a beautiful image of a, a baby and wants to tear it up and destroy it. It's reflected there. That is not a rational thing to do. Um, it's it's indefensible. It's unhinged. Uh, it is demonic. And... Um, and I'm afraid, I, you know, I used to, but I no longer do. I don't buy that argument. Oh, I'm just upset and offended because this happened to me and I've got a kid who's in neonatal care or whatever, or I've had a miscarriage. My wife and I have had a miscarriage. We've been very open about that. Yes, it's upsetting, but we would never bring that to the point of, therefore, I don't want people to know that a baby is a baby, or therefore, I'm going to try and shut down something that's actually saving lives. It just doesn't follow. It doesn't make sense. As you said, Tim, you might as well censor pictures of older people from from the public square, because what about people who've lost an elderly relative? Well, let's just censor pictures of older people now. It just, no one does that because that's not actually the issue. It's not that they're upset because of their grandchild or whatever. They're upset because it convicts. And if not convicting about their actual position on abortion, often it's convicting them of their inactivity, their inaction on abortion. So I've known a few people who would say they're pro-life, but they're offended by the imagery. And I believe actually what's going on there is they're convicted of their inaction and they're convicted that they don't want to stand up and actually receive the flack that we have to receive if we're going to be those voices for the voiceless. So I think we've got to stop taking things at face value. And I think we've also got to stop uh, accepting this idea in the culture that if you're offended, it automatically means you're on the right and someone's wronged you. And we've really swallowed that one wholesale in the church and we're going to talk about that in our next podcast because these exact same sentiments have been repeated to me verbatim very recently by a very senior leader of a well-known christian ministry and that because people are offended that in itself is enough to make the case that uh, we've done the wrong thing and they are the victims uh, almost regardless of what they're offended about if they're offended (laughs) we've done the wrong thing and that is actually a crazy uh, assertion which you only have to think about for a few seconds to realize you know that that cannot be true uh, if we took that to its logical conclusion you know society would fall apart very quickly so so that that's that's an, an idea we just need to uh, be aware of because i'm offended i'm in the right you're in the wrong as christians we have to utterly reject that uh, if we give in to that we are censoring ourselves in principle from basically ever speaking the truth. Uh, and we can't afford to do that. But Tim, Tim I, unless there's anything burning you'd like to add to this, I would like to actually um, draw stumps there uh, and invite people to come back for our next discussion because we're gonna be exploring how these themes uh, are in fact seen also within the church um, with devastating effects. Um, and indeed, I think this goes quite a long way to explaining how it is in the last five years We've seen an exodus of pro-life representatives in Parliament and we're seeing the judgment poured out that we're seeing right now. 
Um, I think in great measure it's due to our swallowing of these uh, unchristian ideas, which actually um, we are we're, we're using to count ourselves out of this game and remove the unborn from the only advocates they can possibly ever have. So um, unless there's anything you want to throw in last minute, uh, Tim, I'd like to just invite people back to our next discussion as we consider um, yeah, how the church is, uh, in some instances, the, actually the greatest proponents of this outrage and opposition to even just a living image of a baby made uh, in the image of God. No, I think that's a really good idea, Dave. I think that's... Uh... I think that's all from me really on this score. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone for listening in and uh, do join us uh, for the next episode in which we continue to look at these uh, issues as played out in, um, in the church and in Christian ministries. Thanks for listening.